Let's see. It's the real social environment, lunchtime conversation, daily at 1 p.m. Today, I'm thrilled to have our special guest, Ishi Hauser, with us to talk about her current body of paintings, which EJ had made um, for the show at Philip Havercamp Gallery, which due to COVID-19, it was postponed. Um, but as I just mentioned yesterday, in order to get a more thick and thin of things, this segment, which instead of 30 minutes, uh, we will extend it to 45 minutes and see where and how it takes us. In other words, EJ and I will talk no more than 20, 25 minutes. Then we invite you to ask questions, to participate, to make comments for another 12 to 14 minutes before um, we can end with a poem read by one of our uh, staff. Lastly and emphatically, we are here definitely to experiment while getting the maximal pleasure out of this strange time. My name is Fang Bui, I'm your host today, this week. I'm so pleased to also have Louis Block, a web manager, an artist and a writer, and also John Capetta, our social media manager uh, and writer to provide technical support in all fronts. You want anything else to say to this, uh, JC, or? Lewis? Yeah, I just want to let everybody know that we're going to be recording this today. And if you don't want to be recorded, you can turn your video off by clicking the stop video button in the bottom left. Um, Fong and EJ are going to have a conversation and then we'll open it up to question and answer with y'all. Um, if you have a question, you can put it in the group chat um, and just say like question, all caps, then ask your question. And I'll um, be calling on you and unmuting you and, and I'll have a nice little conversation. Lewis, you good? Um, oh, and then, yeah, Lewis is going to be doing a using the screen share feature to show some of EJ's paintings while she speaks. So don't be alarmed if there's like a big okay cool. with a painting. Well, maybe we should start with the painting, the amphibian image. And then I would jump right in because I think that EJ and I know each other for a while. Probably 2010, we met through Chris Martin, our beloved mutual friend in the summer and then 2013, I was able to include uh, five works of EJ in the Come Together Survive Insanity show, which were painted with robust structuralist kind of, uh, I would say three-dimensional text. Um, I remember Forget Me Not, one of them being so monumental. Um, and this is before, I really came to know um, her, I would say, undertaking the amphibian imagery, uh, symbol of fertility and harmony, which is very strangely quite apt for this time. Um, so I would like to begin with that very beginning, EJ, um, the, the, with the text, with the text base, um, you know, painted in a way that was robustly, I would say, even sculptural or three-dimensional. And how does that come to uh, transform itself into a Phoebean image in that period, 2013, 2014 or so? Yeah, <clears throat> just before I answer the question, I just want to say thank you, Fong. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and you're doing such important work. Um, I think that the text images um, really do come from sculpture initially. They're kind of like scaffolding. And I think that the kind of scaffolding that you saw in those big forget me not, or um, I remember a painting I'd made that was very big, um, it was called Staggering Loans. Um, and these paintings um, share in the, the recent body of work having kind of this very drawn sense of um, uh, like, like structure, but also um, the importance of the words themselves, you know? Um, the the forget-me-not that you mentioned, you know, it's a flower, but it's an idea. Um, don't, don't forget me, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I really think that, um, the text 
although the words are important, I was also really captivated by just how the letters looked. It was kind of like a dumb impulse, you know? Um, if I'm always writing when I'm painting, I've got like sheets of paper all over in my studio. I've got a table kind of dedicated to drawing. And if yep. something occurs to me, I write it down. And um, oftentimes I, I like the way that the letters look. So I would just kind of play around with their, um, I guess, arrangement, their composition. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess I saw them, you know, both as text, but both as very visual. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm still using text, but I got a little bit out of the text because I felt like, um, well, not felt, but I wondered if there were limitations to using text, you know, if there was a kind of privilege for reading English or reading other languages. And so um, I, I kind of use text now still, but in a much more abstract way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I think most of us who've been following your work for a while, EJ, we noticed that even in the, the, the use of the amphibian image, which is very ancient creature, but you also have an equally interest in technology. I mean, you utilize digital technology. It's, I would say, your own alchemical process of suffering all kinds of strategy in printing, scanning, cutting, collaging, and all of that all together, and not to mention the use of repetition. So can mm -hmm. you share with us how the two can really work together simultaneously? Sure. Sure. I mean, um, you know, I've been painting for a long time and I feel like moving into the digital was kind of a natural reaction from sort of trying a lot of things, mm. um, specifically trying to turn the drawings and the drawing energy, trying to get that transferred into the paintings. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have a very traditional training where using the grid or um, all kinds of different means for uh, turning images into um, blowing them up, scaling them up. And um, I guess about 2013, 2014, I got an iPad and an iPad drawing program. And I was, uh, I was giving a lot of lectures, you know, at this point. And I would sometimes turn around and I would see an image really big. And it just was kind of, a, you know, uh, like, seems like a very easy means for turning um, your drawings into something larger so you could work with them on the canvas, you know? Um, and, I, you know, I wish there was some kind of premeditated strategy, but I think that, you know, for me, it was just the process of elimination, um, how my images have, you know, become the way they are. It's like, I really like using flat brushes, which have square ends. Um, I like my paint to be a certain kind of consistency so there you know and I the way that I touch the canvas has a certain kind of like percussive rhythmic um, uh, activity to it and so you know you put all of these things together and that's kind of how the formal parts of my process developed and then as you know you have some time to step back from the images you're making I did start to make this kind of association with the help of friends of course too um, that there was this combination of kind of ancient um, looking uh, visuality with a very digital approach. Um, a, a lot of people do say to me, your work looks very digital. And I, I'm not saying that that's not true, but it also looks like mosaics to me or weavings, like that kind of idea of how to break down images into component parts um, is something that I think comes across in the paintings. Yes, that's you kind of answer what I was going to ask anyway, because through the, the use of technology, which always associate with speed, you know? Right, right. Um, and efficiency, and yet the, the preference of square brush, EJ, which is how you mobilize your brush stroke slowly, it's also a way to slow down that process of technological fast or quickness, you know? That's right. And, you know, and I think that's associated with my drawing practice, which, as you know, is like very quick and very, uh, you know, it's a newsprint. I, it's, it's not really meant to um, have an association with archivalness or anything like that. But the thing I've always liked about my drawings is the kind of urgency that they have. And so I think it was kind of translating that urgency from drawings and painting. 
Yeah, we were, last time I came to visit you in your Sunset Park studio a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. You was telling me about your particular trip to Devon, England, yeah. mm-hmm. and how that had an impact on you. Why at the same time you were also reading The Inner Life of Tree, Peter Wom- Womberland. So can you sort of share with us how that experience coincides with the reading of the book? Yeah, um, to try to make it short, you know, I, I, I think I think I think of when you get the opportunity to have a show, it's like putting out an album, you know, I'm very kind of old school that way. There's like a side A and a side B and mm-hmm. the album kind of uh, the putting all the songs together makes a kind of feeling for the group. And so every time I've gotten to do a show, I feel like there's been like a different kind of feeling or intellectual concept that goes along with it. And I guess I would start back with the, the amphibian show is really when this first manifested at Regina Rex. And mm-hmm. then um, there have been, you know, then there was like the Barn Spirit show at Derek Eller last year. And there's been this kind of progression from this idea of transformation that is really evidenced for me by the frog or the amphibian. You know, that the 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 crawl that an amphibian makes out of the muck in onto the land up into a tree is is similar to the human progression. And so um, I think starting there and then going. To, I got to go upstate to Bovina um, before the Derek Eller show, the Barn Spirit show, and that really continued to just um, tell me how important nature was and listening to nature and trying to be um, somehow very, um, you know, influenced and on, on a very kind of intuitive level in touch with nature. And then I got to go to Devon and um, the thing that I realized about going to Devon um, was that, well, of course, it's, it's in the UK. It's a very limited piece of land. And the way that they deal with nature there is very different um, in Devon than, than we do, i.e. you can be walking down through a hedgerow and there's, there's, no, um, there's no power lines. There's no billboards. There's very little signage, like the kind of cooperation between humans and nature is very different than you see here. And it made a real impression on me. And, um, and so this work really does come out of um, uh, going to Devon and getting to go through hedgerows, getting to go to very old, old uh, oak forest, which I think I mentioned to you when you were visiting, I got to go to a high altitude forest in Devon, which uh, is like a thousand feet above sea level um, in the UK. And, uh, you know, it, it's just a different tending, and and it, it also holds hands with my ideas about like the garden. I did this series of paintings called the Garden Dwellers, and you know yeah. we are the garden dwellers, and we are the forest dwellers, and there there needs to be a kind of cooperation, in my opinion. Yeah, and and why we were thinking about um, you know that reference at, in the studio, I we kind of also talk about the compression, the intensity, the energy that had been created in a luminate manuscript. We talk about the Book of Care, yeah. the Book of Doro. Um, so there's that kind of density that's trying to overlay um, where the energy, energy is contained. I, I mean, I was thinking a little bit more about the way how more than just the image laying over, but how the energy build up within the border, which is obviously you're very conscious of where things end in the canvas. The right. Edges. Well, I, I mean, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful um, joiner from, from the last thing we were talking about, because what you do feel when you slow down and give over to the power of nature is you feel that vibratory energy of nature. The birds are singing, the you know, wheat is moving back and forth in the field, the wind is blowing, the sun is palpable on the face, um, you hear the, you know, stream trickling alongside of you. Um, and so this compression of energy in combination with these very vibratory colors that I use is um, meant to somehow point towards that vibration that seems so palpable to me in our natural world. Yeah, you, you, to go back to In the Life of Tree, you know, that was written in maybe the mid 60s. Um, Wolf Hoban was known as a forester. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, he takes the perspective of the trees as the way, same way that Jacques Cousteau took the perspective of all the inhabitants of the ocean. Yeah. Uh, and you were talking about the concept of good wide web. Could you sort of share that with what that meant for you, the way you interpret it? Sure. I mean, um, so this term wood wide web that he talks about um, is in reference to the way that all trees in a forest participate in um, helping each other know things about um, like predators, like beetles or giraffes, like they send out scents. They, um, they, uh, trees um, will send out food to nourish stumps that are in the forest. Um, and then uh, another overlay to this idea of how the trees are cooperating is this idea of these um, really uh, microscopic kind of mushrooms that are helping um, the entire forest um, uh, distribute minerals and food and provide a network for this system of communication to go on. And it really blew my mind and um, is not unlike, you know, uh, the way that we're communicating today, this kind of, you know, network of connection. Yeah, that's true. Um, let's also focus a bit more on your use of rep repetition here, EJ. Let's yeah. look the first three or four painting, Louis, um, beginning with um, the Zondelberg, <laughs> the yeah. mountain. Is yeah. that is that reference directly to Thomas Mann, Magic Mountain, the novel? Um, it is. Um, it's it's a book that I I don't claim to have read very well, but um, when I when I have read it and I've I've tried to read it on a couple of occasions, I was really kind of astounded by Mann's um, ability to paint with words. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically to use symbols in a way that I found really interesting. And the way that he uses symbols is like ongoing and repetitive and has this serial nature through the book. And mm -hmm. I obviously was interested in that because of the serial way that I do produce, uh, make paintings. And it just really comes from, um, I love color so much and I love scale change so much that I, I'm never satisfied with just, like if I really like an image, I wanna do it in blue, red, yellow, big, little. And um, it also for me um, connects to music and variation in music and the way that, um, you know, uh, like a, a, especially in jazz, like a song that you love, you can hear it sung or played by multiple different artists and it's very difficult um, if you love a song and you know if it's between Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughan it's like who can pick you, you want all of them and um, so that's where the seriality comes and work and the testing out of different colors and scales. That makes sense tell us a little bit more about the divine log because I know yeah. that something very specific to you. Yeah so um, when I was a kid, in, an undergraduate, um, I was a sculptor. And um, the, uh, it's a long story, but my inability to wrestle with uh, color in sculpture really drove me into painting. And um, I do think about different kinds of, um, like the amphibian to me is a kind of totemic sculpture. Um, and this divining log is a kind of object. And there have been other kinds of what I, I don't know, call them kind of power objects. And it references my interest in um, how we as human beings create things and they kind of become imbued with a power. You know, we make a reliquary and put a saint's bone in it and then we go pray to it. Or we, um, you know, have a painting that we love at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and we go and visit it, you know, over and over. Um, we have lucky charms, we have souvenirs, there's all of these things that really have, um, I don't know, depending on who you are, like do they have magic powers, do they have powers, I don't know, but um, you know, for me they do, and so I found this, uh, what's called a posy vase in Devon, in a kind of junk store, um, you know, it's like about this big, and um, 
it is, um, if you're looking at the, the, the painting here up on the screen, the, the blue area where you see the Y, this represents the kind of area that you enter in the divining log. It's like a vase that sits flat on a table. You know, oh. so, that, so the Y is sitting like down. And then you, you pour water into the Y and the log fills up with water and you put blossoms in it. And when I saw this at the junk store, it just like, it just screamed at me, like, take me home, make drawings of me. And um, so, uh, you know, then for me, the titles are very important. And at one point I was in my studio in Brooklyn and I looked over it and I thought like, oh, it's kind of like these divining rods, you know, that people use to find water, which is a very important and kind of, um, you know, witchy and wonderful thing to, um, especially the Gaia religions, you know, or the Gaia sects are always looking for the, for water because it's so necessary and so powerful and so fertile. And so I just thought, oh, this is even better than a divining rod. It's the divining log. So for me, it was something that was like used for finding things that were buried very deep, you know, in the earth. Yeah. Um, there's a burning question, which I know a little bit, yeah. but I don't know most other do know that you and Chris have been good friends, almost like soulmate for so long. Not to say that you love mushroom because that's evident in the work. <laughs> yeah. But can you just share with, you know, briefly, what do you identify with Chris' sensibility? Perhaps more than others, artists we equally respect and love. Yeah. But you and Chris, something very deep. Well, I, I, would, I would say, you know, um, Chris and Tam, both of them, you know, have showed me um, very powerful ideas, um, like The Beginner's Mind, you know, by Suzuki, um, those thoughts about um, the longer you're making things, the more difficult it is to be courageous and brave, um, you know, uh, the ideas about um, so important to just always be making a new painting you know, just to work, 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 that the only uh, way that you can get it wrong is to kind of submit to entropy in the studio. And um, I think the other thing that I've learned from both of their um, studios is that um, it's really good to have, um, and this is contrary to kind of like market ideas, right? To always have a lot of avenues of visual interest to pursue. And, um, you know, that, um, you can mine your ideas over and over just because you made amphibians in you know 2013 doesn't mean you can't bring those amphibians back to be in conversation with like these landscape paintings that i'm now also doing or the ideas about totemic sculpture or magic objects like i think it's great to have a lot in your basket as an artist so that you literally don't paint yourself into a corner you know i mean i think it makes it more difficult for not artists, but um, uh, I think, you know, our, our mentor artists will always tell you that um, you, you, really, you really have to know how you feel about what it is that you're making. So whether people are liking what you're making or not liking what you're making, you're able to sort that out. So, um, yeah. Well, some of the, those are just, just a few ideas, I guess. Yeah, well, thank you for that remark. I mean, Tam, if you're listening, uh, I failed to put forth your name as prominently as Chris Martin, so forgive me. But absolutely, uh, the, the courtship or friendship that you build among artists that you have a, a kindred spirit and pictorial ambition, uh, even perpetual dialogue about the thing that you share, it's essentially, it's going to amplify in greater latitude of your own interest, as you mentioned. Um, I think on that note, we're going to kind of stop here a little bit and may perhaps welcome everyone to raise questions or make comments. And um, JC, would you want to take it over a little bit here? Yeah, I can take over. We had a question from Terry Myers in Los Angeles. Let me just unmute you, Terry, so you can ask. Terry, you there? Hey, yeah, I'm here, John. Thank you. EJ, thank you so much for doing this. Um, 
that is my street behind me, but it's a fake image. For now. <laughs> um, but um, I've, I've admired your work from a distance, literally now today too, but it's just a very straightforward question. I'd love to hear you talk about your use of color. Sure. Um, well, I, I think um, I've kind of touched upon some of those things when, when Fong and I were talking, but let me try to string them together. Like um, when, when I was an undergraduate, um, and I, and I was an undergraduate kind of at the end of the 80s. Um, and I went to a, a traditional school. I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. And at that time, there was this kind of um, notion about sculpture, which was that sculpture had um, like inherent colors that it was supposed to be. And if you were carving in stone, that's pretty obvious. Or if you were carving in wood, that's pretty obvious. You know, bronze was always tricky for me because like you could put patinas on it, somehow that was okay. And I remember seeing the work of Jessica Stockholder and it mm. blew my mind because, um, you know, I think as young artists were looking for permission, you know, and I was like, who's giving Jessica Stockholder permission to use these materials and use these colors? And it really kind of exploded my head and I had to put sculpture down. I thought, well, I'll go paint for like six months and I'll figure, like this is a young person talking, right? And I'll figure out color in six months and then I'll take that back to sculpture. And um, so that was kind of one of the ways that I came to color, um, my use of color. But um, I think that also it's the notion about vibratory color, having, you know, holding hands with nature. And then I would also say that like, I think the things that we see as children that we're naturally drawn to, which is like intuition in spades. Like as a child, nobody, um, like there's no right and wrong for what you're drawn to as a child. And I got to read a lot of Dr. Seuss as a child. Um, I know he's maybe not the best figure anymore, but those, um, those primary color drawings and like the red, white, and blue, the, um, the hot vibratory, super saturated colors of Dr. Seuss, I think because it's how I learned to read and reading was such a pleasure that those two things really became combined for me. And um, so maybe that's a, that's a start. And I so haven't figured it out. And uh, it's what I love about painting, you know, um, the longer I'm in it, the, just really the, the more that, um, the more I am figuring out or trying to experiment with really basic things like, you know, what blue am I using? What red am I using? It gets very kind of base. Hey, can I squeeze a quick one in? I shouldn't just take too much oh, time. But it, just following what Terry question, Terry's question was and your answering. So are you saying that in terms of, of uh, deploying the sense of color, you know, as we know, there's Newtonian sense of color theory of color, and then there's Goethe, Goethe idea of color. In the latter, the, the, the former is more technical, mm -hmm. the latter is more emotional. Which one are you? I, I, you know, lately I would say I'm a little bit of both. Um, uh, a, a dear friend of mine, Mira Dancy, who's also a painter, turned me on to this book by Kirchner called, I think it's something like, I Have All the Greatest Colors. Yes. And um, in this book, you see Kirchner, um, I think, being both emotional and scientific. Like, Kirchner is one of the our painters who had available to him all of the same tubes that are on our palettes today, both like the intransient colors as well as things like cadmium. And so you really see him, like, um, and I didn't know this until I looked at this book, like, really doing... Um, interesting kinds of uh, experiments with primaries, with complementaries, and, and playing out his ideas, but also using his, you know, not using it in a dry way, or not using it in what maybe appeals to more analytical brain, like Albert or something, you know? So does that sort of help, Funk? Yeah, no. <laughs> not, not answer the question? Well, you did. Kutchner also was a great reader, was super aware of several color, which was very influential 19th century during yeah. the Impressionists, certainly have an also significant on Miller-Ponty uh, when he wrote the book on phenomenology. Okay, I'm done. John? Is he? <laughs> Thanks, Fong. Um, just so everyone knows, Mike Tully put the, um, 
put the book title in the chat, Kirchner's painting, no one else has these colors, um, just for reference. We had a it, question it, next. Oh, we had a question next from Jeremy. Jeremy, do you want to hop in? Sure. Um, I guess it uh, follows along the lines of Terry's uh, question in many ways, which is when you were talking in the beginning about your digital work and you know working on the iPad and drawing there, like I was barely curious, like how you're dealing with color, you know, moving from a surface that is backed by light and dealing with color there. Are you printing? And then how? What's the printing? How are you achieving similar scale as you're painting and Little, if you could talk a bit about that process there, so that you, sure, because yeah, um, so my my drawing practice doesn't exist exclusively in an iPad, and actually for this show there was almost zero work on the iPad. Um, what I what I do is I I draw it on newsprint, and I make a lot of drawings, and then I have a kind of editing process, and um, the editing kind of has three groups, which is yes, no, maybe. And I throw away the no's and I keep the yeses and the maybes. I've found it important um, because I do make so many drawings to be decisive and throw away the no's because they kind of end up being like negative. There's one, negative ghosts in my studio. Um, and then from there, um, sometimes the drawings get cut up literally like the one Fong's holding and uh, put together as collage. Uh, sometimes I will scan something like this into the computer and then print it out and try to work with it in variations. Um, Fong has one that's fairly colorful. Um, most of my drawings are just black and white because it is about this urgency thing. Um, but there were more color kinds of drawings for this show. And then um, I, I think the thing that I've done recently is to try to lift that kind of oppression of matching colors in drawings to colors in paintings, or really even matching them at all. You know, it's like really even uh, sometimes I'll do um, one kind of like drawing on the painting and then overlay another kind of drawing on top and then I'll cover it up. I mean, once I get into the painting, it's like a whole new situation. Um, but I, I would say that probably recently the, the collage has been my most helpful um, tool for getting ideas for paintings out of the drawings besides just the kind of, um, you know, bare bones drawing components. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's not the, you're not really like, it's, it's the digital part is adding something different, not necessarily, your, your color work is, is more in the physical world. Yeah, and, and really the, the digital work is to get images up on the canvas as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then once that kind of like um, beginning stage is there, then, then it just kind of can go anywhere. Yep. Thank you. Great. Um, we had a question. I guess I should just pause. If anyone has questions, you can just ping me in the chat or everyone in the chat. Um, and I'll jump in on your behalf. We had a question from Lewis. Oh. Hey, AJ. Um, Hi. Building off of what Jeremy asked, I wanted to know more about the layering process on the actual canvas. Um, sometimes you're obscuring and sometimes you're revealing the marks that are underneath. Could you talk about those decisions and what the change is throughout the process? Sure. Um, I guess I would say to first, <clears throat> to introduce that question is that um, there's always been this kind of idea that I have in the studio that some paintings are very fast and some paintings are very slow. And this kind of holds hands with this idea of not trying to make all the paintings look the same, like the market kind of wants sometimes, you know. Sometimes there's just like one or two layers, like, um, and, and, and then sometimes they're really labored. You know, there's many, many layers on the painting. And um, Lewis, you'll have to tell me if this is like a cop-out answer for this question. But I think that um, as artists um, making uh, our work, one of the most important things we sort of have to do is figure out um, when it's done, you know? 
And um, this is something also that I've talked a lot about with Tim and Chris, you know, it's like, um, it's a state of mind being done with a piece of work, you know, and being able to recognize that doneness, whether it's two layers or like really labored layers, um, that's my job. And, um, and sometimes there's also cutting the thing off the canvas and ripping it up, you know, they don't all make it. Um, and uh, I probably um, at any time have like, I don't know, 15 to 25 canvases that are kind of just sitting around cooking. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, I think it's very important to um, have a lot of things you're looking at because, you know, um, you change every day. Um, or even in the morning and the afternoon you change. So one way of looking at something in the morning could be different than the way you're looking at it in the afternoon. So um, something that looks like it's got not enough layers on it in the morning could look just perfect by like a week later or something that has like lots of layers and you're like, oh, I worked so hard on that could look completely overburdened and not like fresh and urgent anymore. So it's really this kind of... Um, getting your eye and like getting all all the parts of your deciding to cooperate at the same time. Great. Right. Thank you. Awesome. Um, we had Tam Gonzalez had uh, a question she wanted to bring up for you. Hi, Tam. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hi, babe. How you doing? Hey, good. Another day. Um, so I remember um, at some point, um, I was watching you work as 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 the Berlin Berlin show was coming into focus. You started thinking about the architecture of the actual gallery, and yeah. saying one thing I might do is um, organize the rooms by palette. Like at that time, it was almost primaries, and and this is sort of opens up to once we as artists start working for a specific space. I'm guessing at that point you started maybe in your head slanting, you know, using that as an organizing factor and choice in your paintings. If you were going to go with this sort of three to four choice palette for these rooms, then of course you might put a little more weight into painting in that direction. And just right. how does that back and forth once we have these deadlines that starts to um, sort of narrow some choices that can um, sort of open up the work. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, uh, <laughs> is that a question? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so lucky because now Tam is across the hall in uh, Sunset Park and uh, I don't know, talk about the goddess smiling on you. We, we are um, so happy to have each other across the hall. Um, you know, uh, we were talking about intuition and there, like um, that moment before you sort of feel the deadline is a beautiful moment, that moment where you can feel like, you know, fuck it, I can do anything. And that courage that comes um, from uh, pretending there's not a deadline or even the courage that you, I mean, well, we can talk about having deadlines, but um, the kind of intuitive way that this, show unfolded did seem to organize itself around primary colors. It wasn't really something that I set out as a strategy. Um, and then uh, once I was able to visit Philip's uh, space in Berlin um, uh, back in, I think that was late September or early October, um, and and kind of being able to have like a mind's eye of the space. Like I knew that there were three rooms and I saw all of these, you know, primary color paintings unfolding upon like, you know, in the studio. And it seemed like the three rooms were like the three primary colors. And I sort of started thinking like, well, may, you know, maybe that would be one way to organize the show. Um, but of course, given that, like there, there could be like mostly red paintings in one room or mostly yellow paintings. And, then once I sort of was thinking about all of these ideas, I was like, oh, I, you know, I need to have a green painting so that, you know, there is something besides just primaries. And once I started thinking about green, I started thinking about the amphibians, you know, that color is mm -hmm. associated so much with nature. So. Right. Maybe we'll take one more, JC. Yeah. Um, yes. Let's see. Someone. Well, yeah, Nikki had a question, but 
Um, Nikki's about to read the poem. Nikki, are you okay? Are you okay to ask? I'm gonna unmute you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. You know, I, I, I did, but I, I don't know if anyone else had a question. I don't want to cut anyone off. Um, I don't know, Maria, did you, I saw you kind of raise your hand before. Did you have a question? I'll, I'll let you take the last one. Hold on. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I was curious about uh, what you said about the percussive quality of my painting. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, I wanted to know a little bit what you meant about that and how much gesture and, uh, you know, improvisation, if there is any, uh, plays a role in your paintings. Sure, Th thank you for the question. Um, well, first of all, um, I think I was probably a musician in every former lifetime except this one. And it's been my great frustration because I, I just love music. I, again, uh, talk about like an early kind of childhood thing. I just remember being so touched, so just palpably excited, moved, uh, influenced by music. And I, um, you know, had uh, a childhood where my dad turned me on to like a lot of jazz and classical music. Um, but um, I, you know, I think it's kind of a, again, it's kind of like, all, like you, you're kind of doing things, not understanding what you're doing, and then you kind of figure out what it is you're doing. And one thing I do when I paint is I do crank up the music really loud. And, you know, um, what that makes a canvas stretched over would do is go like this, you know? You, like you can feel it, you can see it on your canvas if you turn the music up loud, there's like a little bit of a, it acts like a drum almost, you know, the canvas. And then it's almost like, you know, you're playing the drum because you've got this brush that you're touching and my natural, and then I, I kind of woke up like watching myself. I remember taking a picture of my, I, I did a time-lapse video. I, I needed to uh, really understand myself as a painter. So for the Barn Spirit show, I did a slow, uh, not a slow, a uh, time-lapse uh, video of myself painting, which compressed like, I don't know, t like a 12-hour painting session into about 45 seconds. And it was interesting because I saw myself going like, you know, this as I was painting. And so there was this kind of um, just overall sense of like me kind of being a percussionist, the kind of uh, vibratory look of the paintings that, um, Music is certainly a vibration, just like color and, the, you know, everything's waves, you know. And, and what uh, about chance, uh, chance emerging from this kind yeah. of uh, practice? Yeah, um, I would say that um, that's a really long question, but I'll try to answer it in the context of this particular body of work, which is that, um, especially when you see areas of paintings and it's kind of hard to see on this Y-Log painting, but um, if I don't like a color now, or if I don't like a drawing mark, that's a good one, I rub it out, you know, I take a rag. Like, um, I, I wasn't really taught to paint. Um, you use oil? Do you use oil? I do, I, I use oil on gesso on canvas. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think about like in the past 10 years, I discovered you could actually wipe paint off of the surface. It came as like a real revelation to me. Like I thought you had to let it dry to keep working. And um, this idea of this kind of like, it, to me, it's almost like smoke that is kind of floating in the, in this painting, it's like floating behind this darker blue. It's like floating somewhere between this light blue and this dark blue in this particular um, painting and so um, that that to me is the interaction of chance because um, and it's also kind of a um, a nod to the importance of um, not demanding perfection out of ourselves you know and um, so, so so that's kind of where it's evidenced I guess in yeah. this body of work thank you AJ I right. think thank you very much to, uh, thank you. music what you just described and remind me when I was a kid, four or five years old, being brought to Buddhist temple in Hue uh, uh, by my grandmother. And I remember um, in see, confronting a big gong in the middle, there's a protrusive part. And I asked my grandmother, 
it reminds me, Grandma, of my mother's nipple. Huh. And her answer was, yes, that's because music nurtures the soul. Isn't that beautiful? Um, okay, so I think it's, it's time for us to end with a poem. It will be read yeah. by Nick Bennett, the Kyoto. Fawn, let me just let me just jump in quickly um, and remind everybody that if you want to keep up to date with these conversations which we're having every day, you can sign up for the Brooklyn Rail newsletter and we'll send a schedule out um, at the beginning of every week with who will be joining us. Um, and I think Louis is going to put the link to that. Oh, Sophia put the link in the chat um, there for you. Okay, that's all. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Nikki, over to you. Hi, everyone. So I'm. Um, uh living my fantasy and uh i'm in the ru the ruins of rome right now mm. but although i may or may not be in rome at this moment i thought i would read a poem by the american poet w s merwin titled bread each face in the street is a slice of bread wandering on searching somewhere in the light the true hunger appears to be passing them by they clutch. Have they forgotten the pale caves they dreamed of hiding in? Their own caves, full of the waiting of their footprints, hung with the hollow marks of their groping, full of their sleeping and their hiding? Have they forgotten the ragged tunnels they dreamed of following in out of the light, to hear step after step the heart of bread, to be sustained by its dark breath and emerge? to find themselves alone before a wheat field, raising its radiance to the moon. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, EJ. Thank you. Thank you, Fong. Thank you, everyone, John, and those that have been followed tomorrow. We'll, we'll host, uh, we will welcome Charles Munson, the poet. And um, again, it's been a pleasure. And EJ, I talk to you a bit later. I'll talk to you later, Fong. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our social environment, lunchtime conversation. It's really, we need to have a meal now. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Bye, Fong. Bye, Rail. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.